read a few things to you briefly. This is the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. And in this volume, which is volume 8 from Baker Books, um, this is an article. I always like to do this because I feel there are sometimes there are things in these uh, volumes that can help us. So I'm going to read a little bit uh, from the article on purgatory. Then I think before I do that, I want to just point out something. Some of you are going to go uh, on a, we'll call it a hunting or a detective uh, endeavor to look up things. And I'm going to tell you, even within the writings that are chronicling the history of the church, use caution. The first thing I'm going to tell you is always look at who is writing. And when you're looking at any books that deal with any theological issues, do yourself the first favor. Look at the author. Look at where the author went to school and understand immediately what type of author from what type of background and what type of education because that is going to give you at least a general overall introduction to where that individual's theology may go. That's number one. But don't make the mistake of because somebody might be a Catholic or a Jesuit to write them off. And I say that because this goes back to Dr. Scott. I remember when he was teaching on Romans, um, there is a volume, um, I'm sorry, it's a series, a commentary. I believe it is the Anchor series uh, commentary. But one of the commentators within that series is uh, Joseph Fitzmaier, who, uh, don't quote me on this, he was either a Jesuit or a Catholic scholar, but did not, um, was not influenced necessarily by his, um, we'll call it the box, the convenient box that you might put somebody in called a denomination or a theological trail that if you usually are within this group of people, that's where your, the your theology will be. Not so with him. And there are several others like that that are simply interested in putting out the truth. Um, there may be influences on that individual's theology that lean towards. But I'm saying to you, first look at the author and understand where they're coming from. Secondarily, don't, don't say, well, that author is uh, from uh, a Catholic background or from a Baptist background, therefore. Just understand that there, there are several different areas you want to look at before you engage in reading. Um, and perfect case in point is I, I've got several books on a certain subject. If you pull them off the shelf and you open them up, you realize immediately that, for the most part, no two scholars agree, generally. And then now you've got the, um, we'll call them the theological lines. So it's important to understand that at the beginning. But I pulled this off the shelf in my office here, and this is Volume 2, A History of Christian Thought by Justo L. Gonzalez. Um, why I thought this was interesting is because it is a three-volume set. We don't offer this, but I'm mentioning this in passing. It's a three-volume set. If you pick up the first volume and you go to the index that should list the authors and the subject matters uh, contained in the book, you will not find purgatory in the first volume. This particular uh, second volume is from Augustine to the eve of the Reformation. So you're looking at from um, the 300s, uh, just prior to the Reformation, and that's a, that's a huge period of time in church history. And yet, if I look up in the second volume, I find the header of purgatory, but I find a very, very small 
piece of information that's all but, uh, if I combine the two parts here, might make up one page. And it is vague at that. I'm going to read it to you to give you uh, a little insight into why I say, if you're going to go looking for history within the Catholic Church, sometimes you've got to go to other sources, which is why I sometimes end up with dictionaries or things that will be more insightful than, than this, which tells me absolutely nothing, but I'm going to read it to you. This section of this uh, History of Christian Thought, Justo Gonzalez from Abington, Abingdon Books, um, in case you're interested, it, I said is a three-part series that is, um, let's see here. All right, it is the second edition from 1987, but the original from 1970 or 71. And I only find one thing in here. It is under a header in bold face that is labeled uh, eschatology and is referring to Augustine's eschatology. And I'm just going to read just very briefly. Thus, for instance, Augustine speaks of a fire in which those who die without being ready to enter the glory of God make expiation for their sins. Now remember, Augustine's theology here is people who are those who die without being ready to enter. So essentially, we're going to call those, according to Augustine, just this brief mention, people who would technically be labeled as non-believers or non-Christians. And I'm, I'm pointing this out for a reason, because within, within the Catholic tradition, it will be taught that purgatory is for believers. Right away there, there's, a big, there's going to be a big discrepancy. I'm telling you, there's a lot of confusion on the subject. And some of you, at least one of you, uh, said, I'm truly grateful to have any information that you can put out on this subject for this reason. They, too, have a lot of Catholic friends who are completely indoctrinated, and it is valuable to be able to have not just the, the thought process of Scripture and recognizing that the basis for the doctrine, as I pointed out yesterday, hangs on only three Scriptures. If you, you ask somebody to back this up scripturally, they will quote Second Maccabees, they will quote Corinthians, um, uh, I'm not sure which other one I quoted you, but there's only three that they quote. And so my issue with that is, and these are actually at least the two, two, two New Testament references are text out of context, and the reference from Maccabees has nothing, not a thing to do with what they would like it to apply it to. So it's text out of context, which is error. There is no doubt that he refers here to what is usually called, in quotes, purgatory. But his references to such a possibility are always vague and hesitant, so that later interpreters have found texts that seem to imply various different views of that purifying fire, because that's what he's re referencing, this purifying fire that he's describing. Some, the same may be said uh, regarding the vision of God which the redeemed enjoy, regarding the place where the souls of the dead are awaiting the final resurrection, and in general regarding several aspects of Augustinian eschatology. Did you learn anything? Because I didn't. And the only thing that I did learn, if, if I'm going to use this as a soundbite, is the fact that Augustine himself was not settled on what exactly this should mean because the writer himself, Justo Gonzalez, says vague at best. That does not sound like a doctrine to me. Does it to you? Vague at best. All right. Um, second to that is a history of Christianity, Volume One, Beginnings to 1500 by Kenneth Scott Latourette, Revised Edition. And you've got to look long and hard again. Um, remember, I said to you that, and, and this is what Catholics do not want to acknowledge. And I'll read it out of the dictionary. Prior to 600 A.D., although scant references to some conceptual idea that seems like a homogenized or confused concept 
of sanctification, and it is scant at best. But the doctrine, this doctrine that the Catholics adhere to, is introduced by Gregory the Great, and it becomes an article of faith within the Catholic Church by the 10th century. It took that long for them to formulate and crystallize, if you will, the ideas that it should represent. And then, as I read out of that other article in my message on Sunday, there are only three paragraphs within their definition to describe. If this is such a pivotal thing, one would think, A, it would be attached to many more scriptural references and would be much more elaborated, especially if it concerns the faithful. Not. All right, I only want to read this one small blip here, which doesn't seem like too much. Um, under, this would be under the... Um, Parish Life and Devotion in Western Europe. And it's just kind of very bizarre, but I'll read you what's here. In connection with penance, there developed the theory and practice of indulgences and the treasury of the church. At first, indulgences seem to have been of a limited kind and were the remission of some of the prescribed works of penance in return for some other act, such as gifts to a monastery or a church. It was also held that if the temporal penalties for sin were not met in this life, they would be required after death in purgatory before the soul was cleansed from its sin and was capable of the uh, vision of God. Now, again, I digress to what I said. If you want to even entertain this as a doctrine, which I will not and refuse to, it essentially says Christ work was not sufficient. That is what that is saying. There is no other there is no other way around this. Now Christ either came for a specific purpose which he declared himself John the Baptist declares it of him. He declares it of himself. The angels declare it of him before he is born. They shall call him Jesus, he shall save his people. There is no way around. You either wholeheartedly trust and faith Christ for your sins to be forgiven, for all the promises that Paul writes, all the promises in him are yea and amen, or you don't. And if you don't, then let me put the real theological implication. You have rejected and despised the blood of Christ, which is what Hebrews talks about. People often ask, what is the unpardonable sin. And in the New Testament, we read things like, all manner of sin will be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Or if you're reading the passage I'm referring to out of Hebrews, it is essentially within the context, those people who come to a knowledge of and yet reject. And rejection doesn't not, is not necessarily wholeheartedly saying, I refuse to acknowledge, but it is also a refusal to see the complete sufficiency in the statement that Jesus made, it is finished, and the reason why he came in the first place. Now I'm going to ask you a question because it's, it's a loaded one. How can you be a Christian if you don't trust Christ completely for your salvation. Silencio. That's what I said. Now, the article that I referenced yesterday is very confused, and this is a Catholic writer, is extremely confused because this writer, who I believe is a woman writing, uh, stipulates in her article that indulgences were never for and not related to the subject of purgatory or the forgiveness of sins or loved ones who have died, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sorry, history records it exactly the way it is. Do not try and change your history. Look, there's a lot of history in the Protestant realm 
we shouldn't be too proud of. There's a lot of American history we could say, well, we're not too proud of, but that's our history. That's the way it happened. But it, I'm greatly disturbed at the, um, it, it's a convenient way of trying to paint a broad brushstroke on something and act as if it was never designed the design of which we know immediately. I mean, indulgences were done to raise money when the coffers of the church were being drained. First it was to round up the troops and to engage in crusades. And not there, there weren't just, it wasn't just one, there were multiple crusades. And you read the history of that and you find out that there was a lot of monkey business. I'm saying it nice. Um, for those who were at the helm, the popes that were essentially controlling the Holy Roman Empire, um, to, to say that they lacked money, for one thing, was essentially, and even Catholics would have to turn a blind eye and say, well, they were raising money for some other reason, but they were raising money because the individuals, for the most part, not all popes, but many and most of the popes lived such an indulgent life Oh, there were a few good ones along the way, and I say good in the way of they weren't abusing the church, they weren't abusing people, they weren't engaging in the behaviors that, for the most part, are chronicled for all to read. And you cannot change the very essence of why we became who we are as Protestants, birthed directly out of the abuses of the Catholic Church. So, just food for thought here. All right, from the um, Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature, under the heading of Purgatory. And the first thing they put here is Latin Purgatorium, from Purgo, I cleanse. We get our English word purge, the same thing from that. It is the name given in ecclesiastical language to the place of durance which the Church of Rome and the Eastern Church teach holds the departed souls until fitted for the divine presence. According to the teachings of these churches, the Protestant is wrong in declaring that Christ brings a full and perfect pardon for all the sins of man. Before man can be received into heaven, his soul must be purged by fire from all carnal impurities. Now, I gotta stop and make commentary on this. We're born in Adam right? No one's going to deny that. That's the, well, some will, because some will. But what I, I think I'm more perplexed by, even in just reading this, his soul must be purged by fire from all carnal impurities. This is a sticky one. What actually happens to the soul of a person? When God places his spirit inside of us, where is it placed? Where does it go? It's not attaching itself to the flesh. He, his, a dimension of his personality, is not attaching himself to our flesh. Why? The scripture even says, what does John say? That which is born of God cannot sin, which is speaking of the spirit planted in the heart or in the soul of man or humankind. So to say that the soul needs to be purged by fire after spirit and soul, I'm looking at it this way, spirit and soul, essentially at the last breath, leave the body. And I need, I, I need to kind of go back for a second, interrupt myself and go back. Some of you will have loved ones that you're you're by their bedside or you're with them with their last breath. Anybody in this room? Is that your experience? Okay, so you know that the individual's body is then lay still, gets cold, rigor mortis kicks in, the, body's, the body is left, and the essential person, their character, who they were in this lifetime, their behavior, their memories, 
everything that is encompassed in the innermost part of the individual, that and the, the Spirit of God depart from the body. And you can say, well, you're, you're not a scientist. No, but I've sat and watched, and not just my late husband. That's part of my calling, to be with people. Sometimes in their last hours, they call me and they just want me to come and be by their bedside. So I've seen enough that I don't need to be a scientist to tell you, and some of you who raised your hand, the body is just a shell now. So the question that needs to be asked is if, if the Spirit of God attaches to the soul of the human being, and it is essentially departed from the body, that which is left is absolutely corruptible and must disintegrate, must be destroyed, essentially. It, it, contained, it contained the sinner. It contained the sins. It contained, it is the remnant of Adam. But what is in the presence of God or in another dimension in the presence of God leaves me perplexed that the doctrine, this type of doctrine says that it is, uh, this teaching holds the departed souls until fitted for the divine presence. Now I ask you something because this is, these are subtleties and they're important questions. In our lifetime, as we are alive, is God not around us and with us? Are we not in his presence? So follow my logic. And I'm not, we're not, I'm not too far off to say this like this. So you have to, it, these are difficult things to explain because they're such deep theological concepts, but superficially they're quite simple to see. The Bible, I just finished saying this and I've repeated it for weeks now. Without holiness, no man, no person, no individual so shall see God. That process is during the believer's lifetime a work that if I yield myself, which is why the Bible, Romans 6, Romans 12, yield yourself. The reason for yielding yourself is for God to do the work in you. But God's already finished the work, the work that is for the forgiveness of sins, and now we're, we're talking about the individual already in the presence of God. So I'm going to ask you this, and it's rhetorical, but I think the answer says enough. If while we live, we are by some degree in God's presence, why would we need to be purged soul, not body, to enter into his presence? If no one's going to take some thought on this, because I... I'm piercing the holes. They may not be, uh, I'm not giving you the depth of, of an exhaustive theological approach, but I'm trying to say, poke holes in something. Poke enough holes and you find out that this is not a doctrine that can even stand. It's not even a doctrine. It's not sound. Every angle of this contradicts the Bible. And I'm disturbed because some of my closest friends will not let go of these pseudo-ideologies. They are not. What is theology? Theology is studying God's Word. This is not even a theological concept. Not one ounce of it is. Let me keep reading. Now, and to my Catholic friends, my only desire, and I only have one, it's not, oh, well, I'm going to try and convert people and I, I want them to see it my way. No, I want you to see what God has said. The final word is God's word, not me. And I'm not finding any of this to be a comfort to any believer. If your final fate after you leave here, say the average individual, granted and barring any illness or any accident, Say that the average age, and I'm, I'm making this up, I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to say, let's just say the average age of a person who gets promoted is 85. 
and you've lived 85 years on this earth, not necessarily all of it as a Christian, but let's just say in your adult life, we'll put a solid 50 on your faith. You mean to tell me, because after you come to the knowledge of God, and I'm a firm believer and I have absolute gnosis of this, that all hell will break loose on you. Every buffeting, every disaster that's possible. Sometimes I have felt so much like Job. And you mean to tell me that the God we serve is going to essentially let me go through the tests? And whether they are tests brought by God or he's going to let me get buffeted by the devil so that I can leave here and have a little bit more, just a little bit more of something that by the time I've departed this body, I've already been buffeted enough. I've been through my trials, my tribulations. And the only thing that I can say is, yes, there will be a time. I can only imagine. I've read enough material on how people view what type of, we talk about we shall all stand and give account. But it, it cannot be. It's not my wishful thinking. If I am in Christ and I die in Christ, why would I be punished in Christ? Again, it's another hole I'm poking. I'm just going to put it out there. You can be mad at me. You can not like what I'm saying. But if you don't like what I'm saying, then I'm asking you to go and do not go to, uh, there's a Catholic website, I think, called Advent. You'll find, if you're a Catholic, you'll find conveniently that the answers are very clean and very, you know, it, it, it's almost like somebody took a nice uh, uh, cloth with some bleach to clean up the edges so that for the average person who doesn't know what's in this book, and most of my Catholic friends do not know what's in this book. Quite convenient to just read there because that's your one-stop shop. That, that's all you need to know. I feel feel terrible for some of my friends. And one last footnote there. If this supposed place or process is for believers, what the hell happens to unbelievers? <laughs> like, if, if, if I'm going to get the shillelagh whacked out of me in my lifetime, and then I'm going to have a little trip to the frying pan before I get to stand before God, and explain myself. What about the unbelievers? What happens to them? Do they just get put in a deep fryer somewhere? I don't know. I'm, I'm being preposterous, but I think, I think my examples are enough sounding maybe crazy, but it makes the point. All right, let me keep reading. Christ only affords a way whereby eternal punishment may be escaped and through contrition secures forgiveness of sins, the ordinary experiences of penitence, attrition must be supplemented by penance. In other words, it is necessary, according to Romish theology, to complete salvation and purification that the soul should suffer a part of the penalty of its sins. I'm going to say it again. No, I'm going to read it again. This is what I feel in, in, in my eyes, when I'm reading the Bible, must absolutely be a grief to God who clearly lays out, and I'm, right now I've got my Bible open to Hebrews, when it simply over and over and through the ninth and 10th chapters, but specifically here, if you keep reading, for then must he oft, often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. To put away sin. Not a little bit, not kinda. To put it away. That means for my faith, for my simple faith in trusting him. 
he died for me, in that he died for me. I put my name there for my sins. I am washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. It is his blood that cleanses me, his sacrifice. Now you tell me why I would need additional cleansing. Can you answer that? Do you think you need additional cleansing? No, some of you are really enthusiastic about that. <laughs> hey, listen, if you want to go for a second round, knock yourselves out. I think once in a lifetime is enough. All right, in other words, it's necessary, according to Romish theology, to complete salvation and purification that the soul should suffer a part of the penalty of its sins. And if these are not voluntarily born in penances in this life, they will be inflicted in purgatory in the life to come, except when special suffering, special, isn't that special? <laughs> suffering inflicted by divine providence serves the same purifying purpose. The doctrine of purgatory does not therefore involve the idea of future redemption of the impenitent. Quote, the souls who go to purgatory are only such as die in the state of grace united to Jesus Christ. Time out. Because I, I, I have trouble even reading this article. I, I should have brought this book. It has a beautiful quote in it, but it's so simple and so succinct. But the gist of the quote, and it's going to take me five minutes to probably explain it, when we are united with Christ, you remember what Christ says, I in them and they in me? I want you to think about this real long and hard. I in them and they in me. So if I die in Christ, Christ is in me and I'm in him. Again, would God the Father make the Son suffer again through me after I die? Because that's essentially what another dimension of what is being said. I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to keep going on this, at least until I make enough points that you can then expound yourselves and, and on this doctrine. And if you have friends and you want to have a discussion, you can kind of put on your thinking cap and formulate your own questions that are not, they should be easy to answer. Because if, we, if we're using the Bible as a template, then the answers are in the Bible. So we should be able to give an answer or our Catholic friends should be able to give an answer, but they probably won't be able to. All right, let me keep reading. It is their imperfect works. It is their imperfect works for which they are condemned to that place of suffering, which must, be, which must all be there consumed and their stains purged away from them before they can go to heaven, end quote. The Council of Trent decides thus, quote, If anyone say that after the grace of justification received, the fault is so pardoned to every penitent sinner, and the guilt of temporal punishment is so blotted out that there remains no guilt of temporal punishment to be done away in this world, or that which is to come in purgatory before the passage can be opened into heaven, let him be accursed. Elsewhere it is said, quote, There is a purgatory and the souls detained there are helped by the suffrages. Listen to this one. They're helped by the suffrages of the faithful, but principally by the sacrifices of the acceptable altar. So let me get this straight. That means that while I am somewhere in, if you want to call it a temporary frying pan, that people on earth have power in their form of prayer to do something for me that technically only God should be able to do himself. And that's biblical? We, I believe in the power of prayer. We pray for people who are alive. We pray to a living God. But to say that in some dimension we are able to pray people out, lessen the time, which I referenced yesterday, or anything essentially that if this is an act of God, how could anything done by man here on earth affect almighty creator, all-powerful 
how could that affect humans that have been removed from Earth? Because it is, if it's an act of God, which, by the way, none of this, what I'm talking about, is. But if it's an act of God, how could human beings have power? It's the same thing as how does a human being absolve another human being of their sins? They cannot. It's a lie. So do you see where, where I'm going when I say I'm poking holes? There's a lot of problems with this. And a thinking person, I don't care if you're a Catholic, if you're a Jew, if you're a Protestant, if you're a Muslim, I don't care what you are, a thinking person's going to ask questions. And maybe you'll ask a question that will become uh, an open door to find out that maybe, maybe we all have it wrong and they all have it right, but I'm going to ask the questions because the questions must align with this book. The answers must align with this book. And anything short of that I'm not interested in. Don't waste my time. But because I realize there are so many people who are either confused or f for most of us, many of us, many of my listeners, they're like, I'm going to say it, what the hell's purgatory? <laughs> what is that? I told you there's a, a lady sitting back there. She once bought me a a coffee cup. It said, purgatory. <laughs> That's the time you spend waiting for the coffee to be brewed. <sighs> All right. You know, listen, if we're going to talk about something that's really kind of a, it's, it's really kind of a medieval thought, very dark and very dismal, then I'm going to, I'm going to put my two cents of humor in there. All right, read you what the Council of Trent said, but you've got to listen to what ha this, this secondary quote that I just read, um, helped by the suffrages of the faithful, but principally by the sacrifices of the acceptable altar. This is what this book says. A statement obviously vague and indefinite. It leaves the most important inquiry undetermined, whether the souls in purgatory are in a state of happiness or misery. Now, let me ask you this question. If I'm being told at the get-go that my soul has to get a little singed, how could that be happiness? So the article that I quoted to you yesterday about how to talk to a Protestant about purgatory written by a Catholic also had an additional article in there about people being happy in purgatory. And I'm thinking, the first thing I'm thinking is, how would you know? The second of all, I don't think it's like saying, I'm going to go have my left arm cut off, and I think I'm going to have a great time while they do it. How could that be happiness? I served God my whole life. Now I get to go into a temporary frying pan. Oh, boy, I can't wait. And what's really mind-boggling, I just got to say this, and some of you are just going to be probably angry at me for saying this. This is what's mind-boggling. Would you join a church that tells you that's your end result? But by the droves, by the hundreds, thousands, millions. All right. This says they are detained, but nothing more as de fide is stated. By referring, however, to the Catechism of the Council of Trent drawn up by order of the Fathers there assembled, we get a clear and more explicit definition. Quote, there, now we're getting a little bit closer and a little bit clearer. There is a purgatorial fire where the souls of the righteous are purified by a temporary punishment and there's some Latin here which sounds like uh, somebody's eating biscuits under a tree. Ad definitum tempus crucite expetior. That sounded good, didn't it? That entrance may be given to them in their eternal home 
where nothing that is defiled can have a place. Now, I agree with that. N nothing that is defiled can be in God's presence. But see, there are severe problems on top of problems with this. If one is not looking at what will happen biblically, whether we stand and we shall all stand and give account, there is the white throne judgment, not, not referring to that. There is the judgment seat of Christ. I'm simply saying the universe at large, wherever you are and whatever you believe, will stand. And I keep referencing Romans 8 because Romans 8 makes it clear we're not going to be punished again. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll put it in different ways to kind of make different points, but the reality is that if this is the place where the righteous are purified by a temporary punishment, then I go back to the article I read and to the earlier statement here, how could it be a joyful experience? Now, punishment is never fun. We could say, well, while we're here on earth, the chastisement of the Lord, we take it and we say, thank you, sir, may I have another one because it's for my betterment. I agree. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about something that's infinitely deeper, if, if this is a, a real doctrine, which it's not. That the entrance may be given to them into their eternal home, where nothing that is defiled can have a place. And of the truth of this doctrine, which holy councils declare to be confirmed by the testimony of Scripture and of apostolic tradition, the pastor will have to declare more diligently and frequently because we are fallen on times in which men will not endure sound doctrine. Well, yeah, I actually think they will if you tell them that that's not exactly the way it's going to happen. And it's not the way it's going to happen. Now, I want to ask you this other question, because if Christ, I said this yesterday, but I got to repeat it, if Christ is the first goer, and it says that as when he died on the cross, we have certain knowledge that he went and preached to the departed souls, righteous departed souls, that is, and then obviously came back at some point to be here, resurrected and appeared and so forth. And again, there is a certain disconnect about this. He was indeed, whether he was wearing a body that is, as we would say, um, in some way altered but the same, for his disciples did not recognize him. But Jesus was the same as he appeared. And I don't, I can't find it anywhere unless maybe I, the page fell out of my Bible that it says that Jesus went to preach to the departed souls and went down to hell. And for a little bit, he went to hang out with the people that were in that temporary frying place. And then he came back. I don't read anything about that. Are you done? No. Thus a definite meaning is given to a vague teaching of the council. There is a purgatorial fire. Souls of the faithful are punished for a defined period until their sins are expiated. One more hole and then I'll take a break. A defined period. Once you leave the essence of what we live in, which is time, everything else will be outside of time. Everything else is outside of time as concerning God. So I'm going to ask this question again. When it says that these people will be in there for a, a specific time, a determined time, let me read that again. For a defined period until their sins are expiated. Well, if this was a sound principle, then I have a problem with this because they are now outside of time. So how does that period get defined, and how does God, now I'm being uh, hypothetical, I'm inventing something just to make a dramatic effect. How does God determine? It's like putting something in an oven and determining its doneness. But if you put several different items in an oven, they might all be done at a different time. And I just referred to something called time once again, which is once you leave this dimension, you will be outside of time. So what could that period be referencing but only one thing because outside of time there is no time. This is not 
rhetoric, what I'm saying. This is to try and identify, or better yet, when it says the souls of the folks here on earth who are alive, pray for those people who are in purgatory to have their time lessened. Now, this may, I may be required to talk a little bit about some theories on how we understand what is outside of time. But God is outside of time as well. And anything that is functioning outside of this realm, I'm not talking about men going to outer space. I'm talking about people dying. You're out of time. You are no longer in time. So tonight, maybe I've just planted enough seeds for the thinking people out there, whatever you believe, to kind of wrap your mind around something that says, we need to look at this a little bit more. And not because I desire to try and make a mockery or try to embarrass or try to whatever. I have only one goal, and I'm going to say it again. I have a heavy, heavy heart both for the people that I know, that I love, that are around me, who are living in this kind of um, ideology, or for people out there who are just living in complete ignorance. I can't save the world. Only God can do what he did. But my heart is still heavy for people who will sit in a church of any kind, Protestant or Catholic, and not learn the doctrines, and you may say, but what about these people over here? Like, you know, we believe in, in dunking. These people believe in sprinkling. I'm not getting into those type of definitions which we could put under one umbrella and say, essentially, at the end of all this, these differences could be easily put together and, and we can say they are enough, they're close enough in proximity that I'm not even going to look at some type of division, but this is completely outside of the realm of this book. And therefore, it pains me when I see people who are blatantly being misled into some concept that somehow they themselves are followers of Christ, which they are not. If you are not reading and studying this word, you're not following him. Don't talk to me about it. I'm not going to listen. There's only one way that you can call yourself. In fact, I was talking to somebody, and I said, you know, when you go on Instagram and you like somebody's content, what do you do? You like them and you follow them. And their material will show up essentially every day when you open or any time you open up your, your Instagram, their material, because you've chosen to follow them, their material will show up. And you're confronted with that material on a daily basis, which makes you a follower in some respects because you're looking at what they are doing. You may not be essentially following per se, but you're, you're looking at it daily. Do you realize that our society, that we have better followers on Instagram than we do followers of Christ? The way that people attend church once a year and call themselves a Christian, they're not following anything except their own desires and their own laziness. And unfortunately, I don't say that to be critical or mean. I say that because it will be to their own hurt and to their own destruction. So I have motives here, and my motives and my intent are pure to show people there is a way, and the way is called faith, not works, and trusting Christ. For when he said, it is finished, he meant it. He didn't say, God the Father, I kind of did what you sent me to do. I at least got this little band here. He said, it is finished, and that statement was a statement that remains a global, universal application to all who will listen, pick up this book, and begin to read and come to the faith. Pretty simple. There's my motive or my motivation. Now maybe you can share yours with me. Get on the telephone.